we'll be going over some of the highlights for the spring 2015. So um, if you have any questions during or after the webinar, feel free to put in your questions in the box. We will be able to address this right after the webinar. Today what we will be covering is a quick recap on the winter 2015. We will also be looking forward into the 2015 spring. Let's check into some of the demand forecast, generation outlook, also, we'll be talking about some of the transmission congestion, and lastly, we will be talking about the market changes, mostly just the market-to-market -market congestion between SDP and the MISO. So today with me, we have Jefferson Rose, we have Parker Cox, we have Joshua Senesho, we also have Adam from the SDP team. First, let's go over the winter 2015, and Josh will be able to provide us a pretty comprehensive review for what happened for the past winter. All right, All right so uh, starting with the winter, um, this past winter's review, uh, we really saw below normal conditions develop, um, mainly in the central and in the especially the northeastern U.S. Um, interestingly, we did have a pretty mild December. Uh, fortunately, that was in our forecast, um, but the interesting thing is if you look at uh, the departure from normal uh, image on your right, you do see a lot of greens, a lot of blues, and really most of the footprint um, But considering how mild December was, I do think it was pretty impressive that January and February we were able to be as cold as we were. You see uh, temperatures averaging really two to four below normal across the footprint, even a few areas four to six degrees above normal across uh, portions of the central, including uh, the Detroit area. And then we did see peak demand arriving uh, January 8th, 106,132 megawatts or 106 gigs, um, overall pretty strong. We did see some peaks even uh, in February over uh, 100,000, so overall pretty uh, impressive winter. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'm just going to go over a few of the key numbers um, from the winter uh, that just uh, finished this weekend. Uh, as Josh said, our peak demand number for the for the winter was 106 gigawatts. That fell in the, the beginning of January, um, but overall, uh, in terms of the month of whole, uh, January as a whole, um, other than that, than the very cold outbreak that drove the peak demand. Um, prices were, were reasonably um, in check. It wasn't until we got to February, we set a, a peak demand for the month of February at 100.6 gigawatts, but we saw uh, quite a spike in gas prices and also in the um, Indy Hub real-time uh, settle for that for that day. And then just look, glancing back at December quickly, uh, the peak demand for the month, 92.6 gigawatts, quite a bit lower than the, uh, than the peaks of January and February. Um, and again, with the holiday season in there and um, they had the cold not having developed into the footprint yet, prices uh, were, were kept in check uh, through, through the month of December for the most part. And I'll hand it back to Josh now. All right, so uh, sticking back to um, last spring, we'll do just kind of a quick overview of what we saw uh, last spring. And uh, kind of the same overall theme is last winter, uh, very cold, as you can see, your departure from normal. Uh, image on the left, we did see uh, much of the footprint, two to four degrees below normal, even some pockets over uh, four to six, as much as four to eight degrees below normal, uh, really focused across uh, north and portions of central. The upper Midwest was kind of uh, the focal point for the strongest uh, cold anomalies last spring. Um, in terms of a monthly breakdown, March, April, May, March was definitely the coldest month. We had some areas nine to 12 degrees colder than normal. And then uh, we did see some of these cold anomalies hanging tight into the month of April. We saw that anomalous upper-level trough in the central and eastern U.S., and that really drove that uh, cold down on northwesterly winds. So March, very cold. April, pretty cold month overall. Then we started to see more seasonal conditions finally um, arriving during the month of May. And next we've got 
Parker to kind of go over um, some of the congestion that we were seeing in the folks in real time the day ahead in the winter 2015. So Parker. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, first, looking at the top day ahead constraints, we have them ranked based on the number of intervals that they bound. So in this case, it would be an hourly count. Um, we omitted zeros for hours that it did not bound, so it doesn't represent a true average under the price, but it is an average for the intervals that it bound. Um, first, looking at the Adams transformer constraint, uh, we typically see this bind with outages around Lime Creek, um, and although we are seeing Lime Creek to Emory return to service, we are seeing Lime Creek to Worthington County go out of service, and it is likely that the risk continues here. Um, next, looking at West Frankfurt to Franklin, uh, with outage season approaching and, and this constraint typically being associated with west to east flows and generation weakness in southwest Indiana, it is likely that we also see this as a continued risk. Um, now on to Ringgold sales. Uh, we typically see this with flows from Louisiana and northern Louisiana into Arkansas. Um, so as long as we see this sort of pattern prevail, this is also a continued risk. Um, on to Addis Tiger, uh, we, we generally see this with west to east flows towards New Orleans, although it is typically associated with outages. So we don't necessarily have this as a continued risk, but keep, a, keep an eye on outages around that area. It might start to pick back up towards the end of spring or summer as load picks back up. Uh, moving on to the real-time constraints. Now, the only difference in this um, ranking is that this is based on a five-minute interval count. Um, again, we omitted the zeros for hours or for intervals that it did not bind in the average price. Um, as you can see, Adams, Ringold sales, and Addis Tiger were big factors in real time as well. Um, additionally, just wanted to comment that Bunsenville to Eugene has both similar drivers and impact as West Frankfurt to Franklin. So again, with outage season approaching, this uh, is a continued risk. Um, additionally, Finnock, we generally see this bind with nearby outages around, say, Lakefield, South Bend, and Winnebago. So keep an eye on line outages around that area. So next, let's look at the spring uh, demand outlook for 2015, we have Josh here as well. All right, so this is a uh, look at our uh, spring temperature and uh, precipitation forecast. And as you can see, um, at least with reference to temperatures, uh, we're not looking at uh, much of an extreme uh, spring here. We are expecting some low normal temperatures, about a degree or two uh, colder than normal. This is really going to be focused on um, central, not so much north and south. I do think uh, more western portions of the footprint will be a little closer to normal. Uh, but I do think we're going to see kind of the same general pattern, ridge in the western U.S., trough, central and east, that's going to gradually break down. But I do think we are going to see those below normal temperatures kind of hanging on, hanging on into central and especially areas to the east. In terms of rainfall, uh, precipitation obviously not quite as important as our temperature forecast, but we are expecting uh, below normal rainfall. Um, across uh, kind of the heart of the footprint in portions of central, even portions of north and south, and uh, that is the overall expectation there. And so for the monthly breakdown, March, April, May, uh, March, it's definitely expected to be our coldest month relative to normal. Uh, we do have below normal temperatures across uh, north and central, some much below normal, two to three uh, degrees colder than normal across eastern portions of central. That does include um, Detroit. Now, as we head into April, I think we're going to see a little moderation. We're actually going to see some areas of above normal temperatures getting into north, and that's as we see the jet stream look northward, kind of a, a reconfiguration of the jet stream. That's going to kind of change our overall structure here. And I think we are going to see some below normal conditions and getting into south and even portions of central. But overall, we're talking of one to two degrees below normal, uh, nothing too significant. And then heading, heading into May, I think we're going to see a pretty seasonable month overall. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we do see some above normal temperatures across portions of the north. That includes Minneapolis. Uh, but overall, in terms of seasonality, I think we'll be pretty close uh, to normal during May. 
So again, uh, overall below normal temperatures um, are focused across eastern ports, portions of the footprint overall for the spring. Coldest anomalies are expected during March. Um, we do think uh, some of the risks are colder if that ridge across the East Pacific, that's been a main driver of our Arctic outbreaks this season. If that ridge remains strong through the, the rest of the month of March, it could be a little bit colder than we have. It could be as much as four, even five degrees below normal, especially across the Detroit area. Um, but we do think that overall the cold is going to be a little bit limited during the month of March. Um, on the other hand, if ridging is able to develop across the south central U.S., and this is a possibility heading into May. Some of our analog years do suggest this. We could have some warm risks uh, evolving later in the spring. And so taking a look at uh, historical uh, spring weather trends, uh, spring offers a transition from heating to cooling load. It initially occurs across south and then for central uh, and eventually north heading later into May. Um, now, is the Pacific Ridge that I just talked about, as it struggles to break down, below normal temperatures lingering into the first half of spring could extend the heating season, might delay the cooling season by a little bit, especially across central. Uh, but overall, spring loads are typically rather weak, um, much weaker than what we see in the summer and winter, although we do see cooling load uh, increasing late in the spring. And as you, if you look at that graph, this is an average of 2012, 13, and 14, uh, March to May, peak demand. And as you can see, starting out March, we're normally in around 85 gigs. Heading into April, once we get that transition from heating to cooling load, we see a drop in demand down to about 75 gigs, nothing really noteworthy in terms of averages. And then getting into May, we see that spike back up close to 90 gigs, and that's associated with warming temperatures as we start getting more and more cooling load. So let's take a look at the generation um, portion of the spring. And we still have Josh with us to talk about the wind. Yep, so taking a look at uh, western and central daily average wind for uh, the years of 2013 and 2014, uh, we see kind of the same general trend. Uh, wind, is, wind generation will decrease throughout the spring months, especially um, as we head into May. Now, we do see some differences throughout the spring when we compare central and west. Uh, we do see a more precipitous drop or a more rapid drop in demand when you compare March and May for Central. Uh, west, it's a little bit more, it's a little flatter. March and April typically have pretty strong wind gen, and then we see the drop off really coming during the month of May. And kind of just to illustrate what I was talking about, we do have a table here that looks at um, percent capacity of wind gen here. And as we see Central, you go from 43% for the average in April drops to 29% in May, west 58 to 42. But again, the main general theme is that if wind follows historic patterns, which we certainly expect it will, generation will decline over the course of spring. And again, May is going to have lowest alpha levels. Um, getting into uh, taking a quick look at nuclear generation outages, uh, we have two outages. Um, not with exactly within the MISO footprint, but outages that will could have significant impact within the MISO footprint. The first one of interest is the DC Cook Unit 2 outage. Uh, they went through a refueling with their Unit 1 um, last fall, and now they'll be taking you know, Unit 2. Uh, expected to last about a month, uh, more or less coinciding with uh, the month of April. Um, and that can certainly um, exacerbate some congestion risks in the, uh, the Michigan, northern Indiana area. Uh, so we're keeping, keeping an eye on that. Uh, and then the, the Clinton uh, nuke outage uh, beginning towards the end of April, um, and that's another uh, 1,000 megawatts there. And we get into uh, taking a look at the uh, historical capacity on outage. Uh, this is just a quick comparison showing the past two years, um, percentage of total resources. And as we can see, uh, we're, we're heading right into uh, the height of outage season right now, uh, beginning the 1st of, of March here. It looks like it peaks right around the beginning of uh, May. Um, and we don't expect too much deviation from the, from the historical pattern that we've seen in the past, uh, peaking right around 25% uh, of capacity on outage sort of towards the end of the shoulder month before we get into the, the uh, strong or beginning of cooling low season. 
All right, so we'll be looking at the transmission congestion analysis piece of um, this. Um, so the first thing is that we will be seeing some panel transformer congestion risk. Um, a couple drivers, um, we are seeing a fairly longer term outage at Pan of Taylorville, which is on the 138 KV, um, which is out until the first week of May. Um, actually, this is starting to go out of service today. The other line that we're also seeing going out of service for more than 10 days is the Pana to Shrem City tap, um, which is out until the first day of May. Um, so on top of these outages, we also see generation outage at Queen Duke, which was discussed by Jefferson earlier. Um, so there's going to be generation weakness over that northern part of the Illinois um, starting from the late April. Also, if there are any conditions with the generation weakness in the southeastern part of the Indiana, which uh, was pretty frequent when we uh, were in April last year. Uh, we were heading into the outer season, so it's pretty common to see generation coming offline for the spring. We could potentially see that generation being pulled toward the northern part of the Illinois or into Indiana. So this is one of the um, congestion calls that we have for the spring. Next, so we are seeing some Neoga transformer risk. This is pretty common. We've been seeing this Neoga transformer uh, for about two weeks or so. Uh, we were having some outages around the Kansas, Kansas to Casey, sorry, Kansas to Sydney um, earlier uh, in towards the end of February. And um, this line is still on the outer scheduler until the 11th of March. So um, for the spring duration, we're still seeing some ongoing work on top of the new work around Kansas. Um, so on top of these line outages, we're also seeing a pretty major line that's the Bunsenu to Eugene, which is the 345 KV. This is supposedly going to be out for more than two months. Um, so for these type of transmission work, it definitely limits the west to east type of generation flow, which is typically from, from Illinois into Indiana. Um, and I also mentioned that during the spring outage season, we're going to be expecting some generation to, to step offline. Um, especially over that southern part of the Indiana, so that will also increase that west to east type of push. So this Neoga is particularly bullish on Indiana. Um, definitely watch out for this constraint, kind of binding for the rest of this month into the spring. Um, the other one, Argenta Palisades, Palisades to Roosevelt. Um, this is a pretty interesting one. We've got uh, a couple plants stepping off one for the APRO. Um, so first of all, we've got that DC Cook, which is on the PN footprint. This is scheduled to come offline soon, um, which is a little bit on that purple point of that footprint, um, if you can see on this contour map now. The other thing that we might be seeing is that uh, you might be losing quite a bit of gas ferret plants um, in Michigan. Um, also, we are expecting another major uh, unit over that northern part of Michigan to step offline. So congestion over here might be very cheeky. Um, because typically we see that cooked palisades kind of congestion generation moving into central Michigan. With DC cook um, potentially stopping offline, that could limit flow into Michigan. But um, since palisade and cohort are still looking pretty healthy throughout the spring season, you might be seeing generation being pulled from those units into the central niche should any of that um, other units step offline a little bit earlier than expected. So congestion such as the palisades are gen uh, Algenta to Palisades, Palisades to Roosevelt might be binding um, mostly over that off-peak period, uh, perhaps during the on-peak will be super bullish on the mission hub. Lastly, we've got this um, congestion risk in the south, um, sort of made into the real-time, um, um, I guess, stage for the past couple of months or so. Nelson to Lake Charles. We are seeing some outages around Nelson. So this is actually in the southern um, part of the Louisiana, um, in between Texas border and Louisiana. We see um, variations of this Nelson, trans uh, Nelson condition. We used to see the Nelson transformer being a pretty major play in the real time. And that is mainly due to some outages around Nelson, generation strength um, in Texas. Um, so this time of year, especially heading into late April, May, you might start to see some cooling lows start to pick up in New Orleans. Um, on top of these outages around Nelson, Smallville, Nelson Carlos, Nelson Transformer, I think generation is typically going to move into that southern tip of the Louisiana, New Orleans. So you might be seeing some, some separation between Texas hub and Louisiana hub. This, 
particular constraint is really bullish on LUHUB. Um, we didn't see it pretty much the full um, week last week and the prior week um, when we were seeing that much uh, above, uh, sorry, when we were seeing that much stronger load expectation. Um, so I think that's about it for the transmission congestion piece of the spring. And we will be heading over to Jefferson to kind of go over some of the sub-regional power balance um, analysis and what, expect, what the expectation is for the spring. So Jefferson. Thank you. I'm uh, just going to take a quick look here at, uh, at power balance as we transition from the winter season um, into the spring season. Um, what we have here uh, is some, some graphics where we looked at power balance uh, from the spring of 2014. We do have some uh, missing data here um, through through the mid part of April, uh, but but nonetheless, um, you can see a transition from from the sort of old regime of power balance, which could print very high shadow prices, to the newer regime that took place over the uh, spring and into the into the summer with lo the lower shadow prices. Um, power balance most common on days of weak wind, wind generation in MISO Classic. And moderate MISO classic demand appears to be a secondary factor during the spring months. So whereas we see a, in the winter months, we can, we can see a, a strong demand difference between MISO south and MISO classic. Uh, as we head into the spring, it looks as if uh, wind, weak wind generations are more of a, a significant driver to see the power balance uh, south to north. Um, then as we take a look at the reverse power balance, um, this is again in the spring of 2014. Uh, reverse power balance, much more common during the spring of 2014. We saw over 5,000 intervals uh, versus about 1,000 intervals of the regular power balance. Um, and the moderate to strong mysoclastic wind generation appears to be a driving factor. So uh, the inverse of the, of the regular power, of the power balance, uh, north to south flow is driven by, by strong wind generation days for mysoclastic. Although Typically, uh, as Josh pointed out, with, with wind on the decline from the winter peaks into the sort of summer valley, uh, the, the stronger wind gen generation days should be fewer uh, and farther apart. And then the last slide here is just a quick uh, glance at the next two weeks or so. So starting at the, the beginning of March here um, and out through the next two weeks, sort of some expectations uh, the for, for power balance driven off of, of temperature spreads, which in turn drive demand. And we can see some, some risk uh, over the first uh, few days of the month here uh, as we see some continued cold temperatures across the footprint. And then as we sort of progress further into spring, we see less and less of a correlation with, uh, with temperature and demand. And we should see that transition to uh, more wind-driven risk. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, we'll be heading over to Adam, who's on the um, FCP desk. Um, so he will be spending time to talk about the market to market congestion. Um, we were also seeing something interesting, so he, he will be able to cover that as well. All right, so um, market to market congestion uh, went live yesterday, March 1st. Um, Basically, this was FERC mandated to take place a year after uh, SPP integrated marketplace go live. Um, which was also yesterday. So they hit it uh, uh, right on time there. And this um, replaces the NERC uh, TLR process, the uh, transmission loading relief process. Um, the TLR process, the biggest problem with that is really there was no compensation between markets. Um, so this market-to-market -market congestion introduces a uh, settlement component. Um, and and that, that really is, uh, you know, once the money starts changing hands, everyone will start to play with each other a little nicer. So. Um, the compensation will take place after the fact. Um, I know on SVP's side, uh, charges and credits will be allocated through uh, uh, revenue neutrality uplift. And if you'd like to um, discuss more of the uh, settlement implications, um, I'm not going to bog it down with an uh, example here, but please feel free to uh, uh, ask your analyst uh, next time you're in touch with them, and we can get into uh, the nitty-gritty of the uh, settlements. Um, so looking at... Um, Basically how it works, for, for those of you that are familiar with the MISO and PJM process, it is fairly similar, um, including some of the, uh, the shortcomings and uh, it's kind of a warts and all approach to what they implemented, basically just like uh, PJM and MISO's process. Um, basically there's a monitoring RTO and a non-monitoring RTO. The, uh, the MRTO um, 
uh, is where the, 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 the equipment is physically located. Um, and basically the first step is they bind their constraint as they normally would, uh, and then they initiate the market-to-market -market process. Um, they'll send the NMRTO, um, some of their data points, things like shadow prices, um, shift factors, and the relief request amount. Because ultimately what they're doing is they're relieving line loading on these uh, certain flow gates. Um, so then that non-monitoring RTO binds the flow uh, to the required limit. Um, and they can basically then uh, it, it starts to congest in that NMRTO um, similar to um, any other constraint really that, that they can basically shop around for the cheapest uh, shadow price and find the most economic solution. Um, so it's iterative. Uh, they, they continue to share market data really until shadow prices converge, uh, something that we've already seen a couple examples so far, um, but we'll touch on that in a, uh, in a little bit here. Um, so there's um, some things that it will do and some things that it won't do. Um, the idea is to get shadow prices to converge. Um, it could shorten the duration of congestion. It, I mean, it should. Um, um, but it's important to remember that uh, it won't cause, necessarily cause LMP convergence. It's congestion only, so there's no impact on marginal energy costs. Um, this uh, um, will not have a direct impact on uh, day ahead pricing. Um, it could have a, a somewhat limited impact um, to virtual players um, in that it, can, uh, it, will, it will impact real-time um, uh, congestion costs. So over time, uh, for some of the more common constraints along the border, there might be some implications there, but nothing that we're initially too concerned about. Um, it will not directly impact sub-regional power balance um, to the extent that um, there's wheeling power through uh, from, from MISO South to MISO Classic through SPP. Um, that you know, that is a, uh, a gentle load. That's not a transmission constraint, so it is not uh, covered under market-to-market -market, uh, congestion. Um, it will not prevent congestion from occurring either. This is also important. Um, it, it, it only can be activated once it's already bound, um, and uh, so it won't prevent anything. It will only make it better once it's there. Uh, there's a few areas where we think this will be most active, at least especially out of the gate. Um, the first is the uh, CSWS Entergy seam um, along, I guess that's Northeast, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Louisiana. Um, this is something that we've already seen a little bit of activity here with the Ringgold transformer constraint. Um, I believe the Kansas City area is another area where we will see a lot of market-to-market -market congestion. I attend to Stranger Creek comes to mind. That's something that we see hit on both sides of um, the seam, uh, oftentimes not at the same time, which has always been a little bit frustrating. Um, so that, that definitely looks like one that will be uh, perfect to be managed through this process. And then um, more so on the SPP side, you know, we see MISO sees a fair amount of congestion um, uh, in, in western Iowa along that Nebraska border, you know, Ron, Council Bluffs, uh, some familiar names there. SPP doesn't see nearly as much of that um, in the real time. Um, and I think that's something that we could see change. So that, that really kind of wrap up the impacts here. Um, you know, we expect to see increased variety and frequency of congestion, but shadow prices should weaken overall. And um, so in um, SPP's uh, market-to-market training, they had a, a frequently asked questions. It's a really good training, by the way. It gets, goes through some good examples. Um, and that's on their, um, their LMS, their learning management system, if you're interested. Um, uh, but uh, they, they mentioned that there's 206 flow gates that are eligible for this uh, RCF uh, treatment, and that's a reciprocal coordinated flow gate. Um, currently, there's 29 that have been flagged as RCFs in their permanent flow gate file. Um, and that's available on, um, at least on, from uh, FBP's OASIS site. MISO, uh, I believe, posts that as well. Um, I find SPP's OASIS to be pretty easy to access, though. Um, um, but listed a couple here that I think we could see um, come into play 
frequently. Uh, you know, I attend to Stranger Creek, I already mentioned. Um, Cooper to St. Joe, um, if you're familiar with uh, what's going on in Kansas City, you know, they have a, a, um, a particularly weak supply stack at the moment. So um, I think this area is something that we could see active in the coming uh, uh, days and weeks here. Uh, Fort Smith Transformer, you know, we have uh, Arkansas Nuke is returning from an outage. Um, that's going to drive up flows on the seam there in the Fort Smith area. Um, Gentlemen to Red Willow, this is deep in uh, SPP territory. This is in western Nebraska. Um, this is one that we see, I feel like lately we've even seen it more on uh, MISO side. So now there is some um, ability to manage that through this process. Um, Lacine de Neosho, again, just, just more that are, that are fairly common. Um, and also this uh, uh, Ringgold transformer that we've seen um, already today. Um, so there will be many more created. Um, um, and this is something that we'll continue to monitor. I uh, encourage everyone to also keep an eye on the, uh, the, the flow gates that are out there. Um, so let's see. I think that about wraps it up for that. Um, I know we're coming up to questions here, but also um, for those of you that are Twitter users, our uh, meteorology team has started tweeting out uh, weather updates. So if you follow at GenscapeWX, um, there are uh, going to be quite a few energy-related um, um, weather updates there. So, um, okay. Oh. Thank you. We will be uh, looking over the questions, and uh, we will be right back. All right, we have a question here. Um, how will something like volunteer to FIPS bend uh, be impacted by market to bend is a TVA line? So this isn't one um, that uh, I have seen listed as eligible for the market to market process. So the short answer is no impact. Um, now to that end, if it helps power move more freely between the markets, that could help. I don't necessarily think that's the case either. Um, th again, this will only prevent and alleviate congestion that is binding. Um, and I have not seen anywhere that lists volunteer to fifth spend um, as eligible for this. That would be something that would be, uh, at least from MISO's point of view, more of something that uh, MISO and uh, TVA, where that equipment's physically located, um, uh, they would need to address their market-to-market -market procedures, and as far as I know, there's there's nothing on on the docket that's going to address that um, at this time. So. So we've got another question. Um, so any specifics on what kind of weakness in southwest Indiana that is driving the Franklin constraint? Um, so we have been able to correlate generation weakness around Gibson coal, uh, with, and especially with generation running at um, generation running pretty strong around that southern part of the Illinois, mostly around the Perrier State, Rush Island, Baldwin area. Uh, we see that generation push from the west to east. So we're actually looking into some other questions. We'll be right back.
So a question here um, about transmission being uh, more readily available after phase two. I assume this is uh, referring to SPP's uh, uh, second phase of uh, integration here that includes things like uh, uh, market to market, uh, advanced combined cycle, things like that. You know, I'm going to have to think on this one a little bit. Mark, market to market congestion will not come into play here really, um, at least not directly, but um, um, this, so it, there might be some secondary effects there, but at least directly, uh, I don't think that's something that, that has come into play here um, out of the gate. So I think that's about all for all the questions. And also feel free to email um, the two contacts that we have here for any additional questions. Um, we will also be providing a recorded uh, audio, also a uh, PDF in the email. Um, I believe we already sent out the PDF um, earlier before the webinar. So thank you again for joining us for today's MISO Spring 2015 Outlook. and. Uh, we will be in touch shortly. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.